April 8th, 2016, Greece. Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras signs with the Chinese ship owner Costco the resale of the autonomous port of Piraeus, located not far from Athens. Ironically, this port was created at the beginning of the 5th century BC, having as objective to serve as defense from foreign invasion, the Persians in this case. The idea of the naval development of Athens was spearheaded by a man named Themistocles, who greatly impacted the ancient era. Let's go over the major stages in life of this strategist, who made Athens a great maritime power and who succeeded in repelling the Persian invasion. This took place in the 6th century BC. The Greek world was constituted of hundreds of city-states of varying sizes. Often in conflict with each other, they share the same language, Greek, as well as a whole set of common values, similar religion, customs or morals. The Greek world extends up to Sicily, which was colonized in the 8th century, but also to the east, towards the Cyclades and the coasts of Asia Minor. Dorians, Aeolians, and Ionians settled here, ventured little in land, but traded, and infused their culture in the region. These cities can be grouped in leagues, like the 12 Ionian cities, but their relations are quite unstable. At the end of the 6th century, these cities are under control of the powerful kingdom of Lydia and its rich king Croesus. They had to pay tribute and send a contingent of soldiers when needed but relations were rather good and remained governance was autonomous in the various cities. Croesus then tries to stop the expansion of a powerful empire with devouring territorial ambitions. Persians and Medes had been unified by Cyrus II from the Achaemenid dynasty around 550. Now under his authority, the empire expanded rapidly. The Lydian king was subdued after attempting to oppose Cyrus. Lydia became a satrapy, the name given to the Persian provinces. The Greek cities on the continent were overwhelmed, but the change were not fundamental to their daily life. From then on, the Persians had access to the coast and built a powerful fleet. They gradually subdued the Greek islands and Egypt. Antagonism between the two nations grew in the years that followed. The Persian kings, almost divine-like in nature, were perceived as despots by the Greeks, who developed the concept of isonomy, the equality of all before the law. It is in this context that Themistocles was born in Athens in 525. His father came from a family of merchants, but his mother was a foreigner, making him a bastard in the eyes of the Athenians. During his youth, he very quickly managed to mingle with the aristocracy, thanks to a real mastery of the society. He was described as being charismatic, intelligent, and could speak fluently before people, which quickly made him famous in a city where the world often prevails in deliberative assemblies. After having led a dissolute life during his youth, to the point where his father disinherited him, he decided to devote himself to public affairs at the beginning of the 5th century. His coming into politics coincided with a resurgence of tensions in Asia Minor. The relationship between the two cultures deteriorated. Darius I, even with much difficulty, successfully annexed Thrace and imposing a protectorate over Macedonia. During this expedition, the Scythians posed a resistance to the Persians at the level of the Danube by employing a strategic and technical retreat from the burnt land. The great empire was therefore not as invincible as one might think. The annexation of Thrace cut off the supply of wood and wheat to the Greeks, while taxation became increasingly strong. The Persian power was now turned to relationships with the Phoenician cities of Tyre and Sidon. A desire for emancipation blowed in the Greeks of Asia Minor. The revolt termed the Ionian Revolt 
began following a civil war in the city of Naxos. Aristagoras, the new tyrant of the city of Miletus, came to Darius's aid so as to take Naxos back from the rebels. The Persian Ionian coalition came against the city, which offered a surprising resistance. Aristagoras was feverish. He knew that the king of kings could dismiss him after this failure. At this moment, he received a message from his father-in-law, Hestaeus, former tyrant of Miletus, held against his will at the royal court. Hestaeus told Aristagoras to revolt against the Persian yoke. This was in 499, when the Ionian cities were rebelling against the empire. Aristagoras decided to seek help from the continental Greek cities. Only two responded, Athens and Eretria, and they sent a small fleet of 2,000 infantrymen to support the Ionian revolt. After some Greek successes, particularly in Sardis, the situation was reversed and the Persians regained the upper hand. Athenians and Eurotraeans immediately returned home. The revolt continued for five years, but the Achaemenid power managed to overcome it. Milet was sacked and its inhabitants deported. Aristagoras fled. Tyrants loyal to the Persian king were placed at the head of the Greek cities of Asia Minor. But Darius held a grudge. A servant was summoned to remind him three times a day, Master, remember the Athenians. This support of Athens to the revolt, however small, was to be avenged. A first expedition was entrusted to Mardonius, Darius's son-in-law. He took over Thrace and Macedonia, but the fleet at the skirts of the coast suffered a violent storm that destroyed half of the Persian ships, forcing them to turn back. A new expedition was launched in 491. The Persians first tried to dislocate the Greek cities by an intense diplomatic campaign. The ambassadors came to demand land and water from the cities, a move that actually meant submission to the empire. Athens and Sparta refused throwing the emissaries from the top of an abscess or precipitating them to the bottom of a well. The Persian army changed its strategy and decided to cut through the high seas in order to land directly in Attica. Eritrea was besieged and its inhabitants deported. Athens had to reorganize itself. The Athenian army was led by Miltiades, who decided to go against the Persians taking the risk of leaving Athens defenseless. At the same time, a messenger was sent to the Spartans seeking for help. Being in the midst of a religious festival, the Spartans couldn't send a fleet before the next moon. Only 1,000 infantrymen from Plataea came as reinforcements. The two armies faced each other in the Marathon Plain. About 10,000 Athenians against 25,000 Persians. The Greek Flanax in a close line made up of heavily armed hoplites, well protected by their shields, extended beyond a kilometer, with the aim of not being overrun on the flanks. Themistocles, who became an archon in 493, and then a strategist in 490, stood at the center of the Flanex, with his future rival Aristides. The objective? To cover the Persian forces, Less organized and above all less well equipped, Darius's troops didn't resist the Athenian assault. They were totally massacred. A total victory was, but not a final one. The Persian troops, who had been reembarked, headed for Athens. It took them 10 hours to pass Cape Sulion. In eight hours, by forced march, the Greek hoplites reached the port of Phalerum and arrived before the Persian ships. Not willing to risk a disappointment, as in Marathon, the Persians decided to pack up and leave. This ended the first Greco-Persian War. For the Persians, this defeat was not a big deal, even minor. But the Athenian victory had a great psychological impact on the Greeks. Those who fought in Marathon were praised as heroes, and a temple was built in Delphi. Athens stood out as the great city-state, which stood up to the Persian immense empire. As the Persian empire was no longer so invincible, this victory inspired the Egyptians, who entered into rebellion. 
Darius spent the end of his reign trying to extinguish this revolt. After his death, his son, Xerxes, the new king of kings, intended to cancel the marathon battle. In Athens, political struggles resumed after the battle. The great winner, Miltades, fell to Paros and was then thrown into prison where he died. Themistocles was now free to become the leader of the Democratic Party and then constantly opposed Aristides of the Oligarchic Party. Themistocles' great image was sketched out as soon as he became an archon, a judge and civil administrator. As a strategist, he wanted to promote Athenian maritime power. This ambition is reinforced after Marathon. For him, this battle was only the start of more conflicts to come. And the final victory could only be at the sea, where the Persian forces were far superior. But his opponents spoke against this idea. Thanks to his oratorical talent, several ostracism procedures were voted against his rivals by the Echolicia, the great assembly of Athenian citizens. The ostracism made it possible to ban, often for 10 years, a politician whose power became too great. In 483, Aristides, his great rival, was banished. Themistocles succeeded in passing a naval law to build 200 warship, the triremes. Two important elements facilitated this vote. Firstly, Athens had been at war with the Aegina since 488, which would have made victory easier. Furthermore, the exploitation of the mines of Lorien, considerably enriching Athens, would have permitted the financing of the project. Rather than redistributing the revenues among the citizens, Themistocles entrusted these revenues from the mine to the richest, who were responsible for financing the construction of the ships. Within two years, Athens had the largest Greek fleet. But his naval law went further. He proposed to abandon the port of Pherelium to establish a new one in Piraeus, which he fortified. All of these decisions were made in an atmosphere of terror over the Greek cities. And Xerxes was preparing for a massive attack. Preparations mobilized all the resources of the empire, starting from 485. Xerxes resumed the plan of 492, with a fleet along the coast to protect and supply the ground troops, who would attack from the north. In order to avoid the drama of the first invasion attempt, Xerxes planned to dig a canal in the Acti Peninsula. Like his father, the sovereign aimed at dividing the Greeks by sending embassies, but he went further. In order to prevent military support from the Greeks of Sicily, led by the powerful tyrant of Syracuse Gilon, Xerxes joined force with their Carthaginian rivals, who must attack Sicily at the same time. Gilon will send no aid to the Greek cities. In 481, the army of about 300,000 men of about 100 nationalities was set to leave. To cross the Hellespont, a boat bridge was built, but a storm broke the construction. Angry, Xerxes inflicts 300 lashes to the sea as punishment. Two new bridges were built, each with 314 ships lined up over three kilometers. In the spring of 480, the immense convoy started to move. Plutarch even declared that the Persian Empire had emptied itself of its men. The Greeks were in panic, all the more given that their oracle of Delphi announced a coming military catastrophe. A congress of cities met in Corinth to plan the defense. It was presided over by Sparta, whose army was considered the most powerful in Greece. Some cities were absent, such as the mighty Argos, often in conflict with Sparta. The climate was stormy, but Themistocles once again managed to impose his views by exalting the participants. 31 cities committed themselves to defend Greece from the Persian attack. This defense alliance was led by the Spartans. The northern cities gave up one after the other without posing any resistance. 
Themistocles joined the first expeditionary force entrusted with stopping the Persian advance in the Vale of Temp. Sensing the trap, Xerxes overcame it, causing the first Greek retreat. Phalasy fell into the hands of the Achaemenid sovereign. A new fleet plan was needed, but the Spartans were still reluctant to send all of their troops. Their religious festivities prevented them from doing so once more. Themistocles has to use his powerful rhetoric to convince them to send a fleet. 300 elite hoplites, under the command of Leonidas I, must hold the pass of Thermopylae, a narrow bottleneck offering an undeniable defensive advantage. He was joined by other alliance troops, a total of 7,000 men. At the same time, 271 triremes were positioned at the level of the Artemisium to contain the enemy fleet. The Spartan Euripides was in command, assisted by Themistocles. The Oracle of Delphi had prophesied a few days before the maneuver, we must pray to the winds, for they will be the allies of the Greeks. The gods smiled at them, indeed. A powerful storm destroyed 400 Persian ships. Xerxes could no longer divide his fleet. The Greek ships were pulled ashore with no damage. At Phenopoli, Leonidas heroically resisted the Persian attacks. The battle for a art mission showed that the Greeks really mastered the waves, while the disorganized Persians suffered many casualties. On land and in the sea, the resistance lasted three days. Leonidas's position was bypassed after a betrayal, and the last Spartan soldiers are killed. Their heroic sacrifice became the glory of Sparta. Themistocles withdrew to Athens. Being cornered, he made an original proposal to the Athenians. While Xerxes' army ravaged everything in their path, the Athenian strategist suggested to abandon Athens and fight a battle at sea. For him, it was impossible to beat the land forces in a head-on battle. It was hence necessary to cut the army from its maritime supply. The solution was adopted. Attica was abandoned, taking refuge behind the Isthmus of Corinth, but especially in Aegina and Salamis. The Athenians watched helplessly as their city was sacked. Themistocles had to act quickly, for the Greeks were already divided over the path to follow. As tricky as Ulysses, Themistocles set a trap for Xerxes. He sent a messenger to the King of Kings telling him that the Greeks have yielded to panic and that he could achieve complete victory by attacking right away. Xerxes took the bait, galvanized by his victories. Trusting this type of information, he sent his fleet into the Strait of Salamis, where the Athenian strategist was waiting. The great king stood at Mount Agalia to witness the battle. The narrow bottleneck prevents the full deployment of his fleet. Worse, the maneuver is difficult. The ships collide. The Athenians, well favored by the winds, rammed the Persian ships before they embarked on a collision course. For 12 hours, the Greek ships pierced and sank the Persian ships. Xerxes, overwrought, returned to Susa. Themistocles' tactics paid off, but the empire was still not defeated. Mardonius remained in Attica and the Greeks divided again. It took a year for a powerful Greek coalition to be formed. Mardonius once again ravaged Attica and withdrew to Plateo, a suitable area for his cavalry. About 50,000 men faced 110,000 Persians. The battle was indecisive. The death of Mardonius precipitated the outcome. The Persians were on the run. At the same time, on the other side of the Aegean Sea, the Greek hoplites managed to land at Mycale and destroyed the Persian ships. They seized Sestos, ensured control of the Hellespont, and secured the wheat route with the Scythians. The Achaemenid Empire then faced an uprising in Babylon. Against all odds, the Greeks had shaken the largest empire in the world, and in the long run, discovered a call for imperialism. Themistocles was considered the man behind this victory. He was filled with honor, but wished to go further. He loved offensive strategy, 
taking the war to the heart of the empire. The submission of the Aegean Islands was the starting point of the Athenian phallusocracy. He was as suspicious of the Persians as he was of the Spartans, and had walls built, and proposed the idea of a wall linking Piraeus to Athens. Internal quarrels came up again between and within cities, no doubt exhilarated by the prestige. Themistocles was vain, excessive, with a pronounced taste for riches. His old rivals, recalled during the Greco-Persian Wars, blamed him for plundering the public treasury. Having become too powerful, he was finally ostracized in 470. He took refuge in a few Greek cities, but given that he was being threatened, he fled to the new Persian king, Artaxerxes. Less resentful than his ancestors, the sovereign filled him with honor and offers him the governance of Greek provinces in Asia Minor. Excluded from the city he had succeeded in raising to a great nation, taking refuge with his former enemy. Themistocles died at the age of 65 in unknown circumstances. Plutarch and Thucydides consider that he committed suicide after receiving the king's order to fight against his fellow Athenians. Others say he simply died of old age. Themistocles played a great role in the history of the ancient world. In a form of government where eloquence is capital, he succeeded bringing out a long-term strategic vision for Athens. The impact of the victory on the Persians consolidated Greek identity and raised its superiority over the barbarians, making it part of history. The achievements of the Greco-Persian Wars are placed alongside the great Homeric tales of the Iliad or the Odyssey. The creation of the Delian League brought the city of Attica to the peak of its power. The hegemonic expansion of Athens would eventually annoy its powerful Spartan neighbors, with whom the Peloponnesian War broke out in 431, and which would be fatal for Athens. The greatest danger comes from the Spartans and not from the Persians, Themistocles kept repeating. <laughs>